Um, yeah, this, this little card is just, uh, there, you know, I'm, um, you read there, leadership is always essential, but sometimes it's critical. Today is one of those times, Nehemiah, one of those leaders, how about you? And it's just, it's just a, a little online one message, and I thought with the opportunity to be before a whole bunch of pastors and a whole bunch of men, um, this might be something that edifies you, it's free, you can take it, but uh, just thought we'd bring that along with you. So you want to turn in your Bible, please, to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel 6, the um, content, sort of the idea, the big idea of my assignment here is uh, prayer. Daniel and his prayer life. And more specifically, um, what we find in Daniel chapter 6 regarding Daniel and his prayers and so, being that prayer is the theme, the idea, we're going to look through that lens in Daniel 6. I'm going to um, title this message, The Practice of Prayer. We'll find that it really was what it is that Daniel did. He practiced prayer, was a part of his life. And so, I'll open in prayer, and then we'll take a look at uh, this, this chapter together. So, Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the great privilege uh, that you've given me now to be here together with my brothers and to consider this idea of prayer, where if we'll pause a second, it is an astounding thing to think that the God who spoke everything that we see, everything that is into existence, desires to hear from us, desires to meet with us, desires to comfort, counsel, correct us, even within the context of this supernatural thing, powerful supernatural thing called prayer. I think just a moment here, Lord, about the sheer potential that exists in this room. We look throughout human history where just one man, one man, Lord, among us is there one man that is going to hear what it is that you've got to say. And today is going to be a day where something starts, Amen. the likes of which only you could get the credit for and the glory for. And right through this thing that every single soul, every single saint within earshot can do, can pray. So however that thing works, where you work within us, and you get us past ourselves, and you get us past this world, and you get us past all of the busyness, and all of the craziness, and all of a sudden, we find ourselves with you, and with you more and more, and with you more and more often, and with you more and more frequently, we can expect something divine, something good, something transcendent something holy, something supernatural may, ha may happen when we just get on our knees. We just get on our knees and say, Dear Father, here I am. Thankful for all you've done. What's next? So Holy Spirit, point us to Jesus. Stir us. Quicken us now. And all God's men say, Amen. Amen. So we come to one of the most familiar, one of the most famous stories of our main man, Daniel, his epic adventure in the lion's den. And though we've learned some, in fact, more than learned uh, some wonderful things, we've actually already experienced some wonderful things. Already, there was a throng of men who came last night, got down on the knee, 
And uh, Scripture came to life because Scripture promises if you confess with your mouth, right? If you you come before God and confess your sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us and to forgive us of our sins. And right up here last night, there was all kinds of washing and cleansing that went on. So we haven't just heard great things. Some of us have already experienced glorious things. But we're going to pay special attention to what this passage, this, these verses suggest regarding Daniel's prayers. Our big idea, of course, is dare to be a Daniel. And we're going to see three things in Daniel's praying that if we dare to be like him, maybe ours too. His results are very likely to be ours, which in the end could make us like Daniel. Daniel 6 verse 1, we read, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. At this point, Babylon has fallen, that great golden head now gone, and in its place, the silver chest and arms of the Medes and the Persians, and exactly as God said through Daniel. Daniel's now quite old, perhaps 80, but we're going to see that he is still, in his old age, going to need to live by faith. Church, you do know this. Men, you do know this, that the life of faith is for life. We've spent a little bit of time talking about the next generation, talking about all of the many young men among us, which is incredibly encouraging to see. But isn't it true that there are some other seasoned fellows here, some fellows that have, uh, by way of age and by years, become a little gray? Listen, the life of faith is for all of life. There's no cruise control. We don't ever get to a place where you go, it's just going to get easy from here. So here's an 80-year-old man, and he is still going to need to walk by faith. Reminds me, by the way, if you've heard Pastor Sandy over the years, as I have, and been ministered to by just the way that he is, his gifts, and the way that he writes, and the way that he communicates, and the way that he leads here in the South, he's referenced this book many, many times. A long obedience in the same direction. And here's here's Daniel, 80 years old, demonstrating a long obedience in the same direction. So the Medo-Persian leader is now going to establish his cabinet to rule the then world. And once again, Daniel finds himself in the upper echelons of leadership. So we've got 120 leaders over the realm, over them three, and Daniel is one, verse three. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. The king, because of that, the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Incidentally, this chapter provides a really cool snapshot of the coming Christ, his innocent death, burial in a sealed tomb, and his miraculous resurrection. And like Jesus, Daniel, as he remained low, only to see, only seemed to go higher and higher and higher and higher. You see, Daniel, Daniel remained humble before his God. By the way, it's a phrase that we'll see before his God. It's a repeated phrase, but as he remained humble before his God, and I don't know how much more humble you can actually get but then by by to be down on your knees before him. Daniel was frequently here. He was frequently humble before God, and therefore God exalted him higher and higher before men. Evidently, Daniel cultivated the spirit, that part of us, that part of man that connects and communes with God. We were told that he had an excellent spirit. He had a spirit life cultivated and that spirit life cultivated paid him handsomely on earth. Paul told the New Testament church this, physical training is good, it's of some value, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. End of prayer, which we haven't even seen yet in Daniel's life, Jude writes this, but you, dear friends, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying always in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God. So Daniel's superb spirit cultivated took him higher and higher on earth before men. Verse 4. So the governors, satraps, they sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning him. 
uh, uh, but because he was, uh, but because he was faithful, nor was there any uh, error or fault found in him, or they could not find any charge or fault because there was no error or fault found in him. These men said, "Well, we shall not find any fault in against Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God." Saul Alinsky wrote a book called "Rules for Radicals." He actually dedicated the book to none other than Satan. Hillary Clinton cherished Alinsky's ideas so much that she wrote her senior thesis about him. During Bill's presidency, she asked her college to actually seal the document, which they did until his presidency was over, being so controversial. But in his book on how to bring community change, uh, i.e. a social revolution, rule number four in Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals is this. Make your enemy live up to the rules of its own book. Pay attention to what's going on. So Daniel's enemies, unsuccessful in finding Daniel misfiring their rules, think the only way that they can get him is if he breaks some of his own. Verse 6. So these governors and satraps, they thronged before the king, and they said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. And all the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, satraps, counselors, advisors, they, we consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the lion's den. So we've got hundreds and hundreds of men. And they longingly and they affectionately look upon this king. They gaze upon him. Few men are strong enough to refuse the influence upon the heart when flattery like this comes knocking. They either knew that he would fall to it, pray to it, and they looked on and said, that guy's got a propensity. He's the kind of guy that loves the spotlight on him. He's the kind of guy that if we can just, he's the kind of guy that we can manipulate in that way. Maybe they just knew it within themselves. I would love a decree where everyone would worship me uh, for 30 days, or maybe it was just all straight from the pit probably a combination of all of those, but they essentially say, so, O oh king, we've been thinking, you know, like we who are like somebodies in the realm, and we've been thinking that you deserve to be worshipped. You can imagine him almost shudder like, me? Yeah, you. And we're like, the, we're the everybody's who's somebody, and we've all got together, and we think it would be a great idea for 30 days for no one else and nothing else to be worshipped but you. The fate of anyone who would fail to give you worship would be the lion's den. Verse 8, now, O king, like now, establish the decree, sign the writing, so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Solomon once observed, he who hastens with his feet sins. We got a great idea. Why don't you receive worship? Now, sign it now. Daniel's, Daniel's enemies, they wanted him dead yesterday. You do know that your enemy wants you dead yesterday. My enemy wants me dead yesterday too. But seeing the king's pulse rise so rapidly at the thought that he would be in such a grand spotlight, they go for the jugular. Now, O king. And he signs the law quickly. I imagine his hand shaking with joy as he signed the document. Verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with the windows open toward Jerusalem... He knelt down on his knees three times that day, prayed, giving thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Seems to me that the occasional and the rare in our lives is often affected by the habitual. That is, maybe our failures and maybe our successes in the big moments of life are in a sense sort of prefixed and set by all the little everyday choices that we make. In life, John Maxwell once said, We will never change our lives, like the sum total trajectory of our lives, until we change one thing that we do daily. And so, on the one hand, you think, Well, I'm sure Daniel really gave this a lot of thought. He, he was, at the end of the day, incredibly wise. On the other hand, it's possible, even likely, 
he gave this very little thought at all. Prayer wasn't something that Daniel could live without. If Samson's hair was the source of his strength, prayer was the source of Daniel's. Without prayer, Daniel was and had nothing. He enjoyed nothing. It was, the, it, was the, it, was, it was everything to him, verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Now, we aren't told, but I'd submit to you that they caught him on day one. You know what I mean? They think it's going to take 30 days to catch him, so they're like, you know, within 30 days, I'm sure we'll catch him. I think, they, I think it only took one day, which makes me wonder... How long would it take my enemy to catch me in prayer? How many days would it take? Some more insights here, by the way, into Daniel's praying. We already know that it's his habit from early days. It was sort of the pattern of Daniel's life, the rhythm of his life. But we note here also that he's giving thanks. We see him also asking for help. It's what supplication means. And so sort of the, we're getting, we get a little idea into the content of, of the man's praying. It, it, his prayers here, at least what we're told in this passage alone, is this gratitude, giving thanks to God, and guidance, like, Lord, what's next? That's what formed Daniel's praying, verse 12. And they went before the king, having caught Daniel, and they spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered, saying, the thing's true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered, saying before the king, that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you signed, but makes his petition three times a day. That Daniel, you can pick up on the disdain of these folks toward this Jew, reveals not only the ugly, racist heart of men, but also the deep-seated hatred of Satan. To me, racism is a great evil and a great sin, amen? It shouldn't be named anywhere near any of the sons of God. But to me, listen now, anti-Semitism comes from a whole nother place altogether. That's darker still, not to make nothing light of racism, wherever you find it. And we're not the only culture that has to deal with it, because you find it in the hearts of wicked men. But this anti, that, that Jew, one of the, one of, that Daniel, one of the, one of the um, captives from Judah, d- drove them crazy. Verse 14, and the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored until the going down of the sun to deliver him. It was, it was pride that took this king down. This is pride that made the king take the bait initially. And pride, again, that has him so disappointed with himself. But to his credit, he did against all odds and the law seek somehow to deliver Daniel, but the sun was setting and the time was running out, verse 15. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Now, O king, that is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no decree or statue which the king establishes may be changed. Nobody likes to be manipulated, especially those who have power over others. And this man knows right now that he has been manipulated big time. He knows it. He's been worked. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel, cast him into the lion's den. But the king spoke to Daniel, saying, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. What a testimony this, this, this aged man possesses. Not only, by observation, do I say of you, you serve your God continually, but, but by some measure, the king also knew of the saving power of his God by watching Daniel's life. I mean, as an 80-year-old man is cast some 20 feet to the ground. I mean, listen, when you're 80, you don't need lions. You throw me 20 feet from the ground, I ain't going to make it. You throw an 80-year-old man, decrepit dude, down into a hole, he's going to die. But notice, the king says, "But, but your God, Daniel, could deliver you. You ever wonder what people see of your faith and know of your God when they watch your life? Would anyone say, 
to, to you or to me. I know you serve your God continually, and by watching your life, I know that, that your God has the power to save even an 80-year-old man at a 20-foot fall, let alone the lions. Verse 17, well, then a stone was brought. Sounds familiar, right? There was a stone brought laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. The sealed den's a fitting symbol of another tomb where another innocent man would one day lie slain for the sins of the world. The seal here wasn't so Daniel couldn't get out. He likely couldn't get up, you know, after the fall, but so that others could not get in to help him. And what an insight here. The king... Like the one with all the authority. Not only sealed Daniel's fate, but sealed the tomb, yet he's the only one that wants to see Daniel freed the most. Sound familiar? Isaiah, listen to Isaiah. And they made his grave, the grave of our Savior, our King, with the wicked because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord God to bruise him. Verse 18, now the king went to his palace, spent the night fasting. No musicians were brought uh, before him. All his sleep left him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a loud lamenting voice, uh, uh, saying, Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, oh, king, live forever. Isn't that wonderful? All good here, man. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I've done no wrong before you. How great, I love it. O king, live forever. My God sent his angel to shut the mouths of the lion. I'm good because he found me innocent before him. Verse 23, now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury, whatever, was found on him because he believed in his God. Now remember, we're looking at Daniel's life through the lens of prayer as we find it uh, predominantly and in a sense exclusively in Daniel chapter 6. And this great passage tells us that here's a man who prayed. It was his custom to pray. It was the pattern of his life to pray. He practiced it. It was, the, it was the rhythm of his life to pray. But we learn also that he's uniquely capable, useful. He has this excellent spirit within him. He's innocent before God and man, and also that he was delivered because of his faith, which makes me want to ask the question, could Daniel's ability, could Daniel's integrity, could Daniel's faith somehow be interconnected with his prayers? His abilities, his integrity, and his faith, and his prayers. It's the only thing, in a sense, that we're told that he did in the passage, and yet we learn these other things about him. Verse 24. And the king gave command, and they brought these men who had accused Daniel, cast them into the lion's den, them, their children, their wives. Listen to this. And the lions overpowered them, breaking all their bones in pieces, before they ever hit the bottom of the den. Sort of like a human Vitamix for the wicked. It's interesting what they wanted for Daniel, they got. Remember the enormous shish kebab that Haman prepared for Esther's Mordecai? Yeah, he got that, didn't he? <laughs> well, this is going to be so good. It's going to be so good. We're going to gig Mordecai. We're going to shish kebab that dude in the presence of everybody. Why are you guys putting handcuffs on me? You like shish kebab. <laughs> there is no small amount of human comfort and masculine joy. This is something I think we guys kind of enjoy in a way that maybe the ladies don't. To see that what our enemies plan for us, God will often give to them. And scripture exhorts us and exhorts us strongly. Brothers, do not avenge yourselves. Rather, give place to God's wrath. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. 
I will repay his promise. Then King Darius wrote, 25, to all the peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I'm going to make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he's the living God, steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the end. Amen. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And maybe we could add, in a sense, or include in this sort of running list of things that appear in the passage, um, plainly telling us about Daniel who prayed, is that as he prayed, perhaps we can add to these other things that, that, that God got the glory because he prayed in the end. So dare to be a Daniel, a man who prayed. He practiced prayer. It wasn't something that he wasn't intermittent. He wasn't um, sporadic. He wasn't inconsistent. It was, it, there was a pattern in his life. Three times a day, bowing down three times, as was his custom from his youth. He, it, was, it was the most prominent feature of his faith. And it can and should become ours. And if so, then we could safely say, at least in this, at least in praying, we could, listen, gentlemen, you and I could become like one of the greats, Daniel, if we simply prayed. Simply prayed. So I've got three things here as we close, and that is this. Um, three things that the practice of prayer seems to have accomplished in Daniel's life. Number one, the practice of prayer, jot this down, please take notes, it'll be just brief. The practice of prayer perfects us. Practicing prayer perfects us. Daniel's spirit was perfected, his character was perfected, his faith was perfected in prayer. We read Daniel was rising above his other leading peers because of an excellent spirit that was in him. And again, our passage, you know, predominantly or supremely tells us that here's a man who, who simply prayed, who regularly, faithfully prayed. And it makes sense, right? We connect with God in spiritual ways. It's why Jesus said, you must be born again. But the fall has us all fouled up, to put it mildly. Adam, you remember, was prior to the fall in perfect spiritual communion with God, a spiritually alive man, then sin came and he died. That is spiritually the man who is spirit, soul, and body, which had a, which had a glorious communion with, who is, with God, who is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and man was spirit, soul, and body. What did he say? In the day that you eat of the tree, you're going to die. Did he die? Yes. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, class. Yeah, he did die. Did he die physically? No, he died spiritually, so he's no longer spirit, soul, and body. The spirit then was dead, and he was now, then listen, body, soul, and spirit. And all of his life, and you remember it well, don't you? All of his life, his soul, in a sense, was controlled by the appetites of the flesh. Do you remember that life? Where you only did what your body wanted to do? You were like, who will deliver me from this body of death? I don't want to do these things. I don't want to continue to be a slave to these things. You remember when we were lost and powerless over the flesh. You remember the moment, though. Do you remember the moment, though, the very moment that you were born again and the Spirit came alive and resurrected your soul and you found a new power over the flesh? you remember that day? When like the sky was blue and the grass was green and there was something inside you that you had actually been born again. You were alive. You were dead in trespasses and sins. He made alive together with Christ by a moment that he came to you. Anybody here? I wasn't looking for God. I was running as far away from him as I could and he came and found me. spirit revived and in that connection with all of a sudden we're born again and all of a sudden it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, now, the, now I'm alive and the spirit now rules over the soul, rules over, over the flesh. 
And now, and now we have this beautiful, glorious communion. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now the Son of God alive. Spirit, soul, and body. Now there's that relationship restored. You remember that? Listen, some in this room right now know nothing of what it is of this kind of life. But you can today. You can today. If you're here right now and you don't know Jesus Christ, listen, there ain't no accident that you're here now. You ain't in a group of a bunch of Jesus followers by accident. You're not. And if you're running from God, this is a weird place to come. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? You don't come here. And then listen, some of us in, the, in this room remember those early days where we talked to God so much. No one taught us anything, did they, about prayer? You're just alive all of a sudden. You're like, well, golly, there you are, Lord. And you're in your car, and you're in your shower, and, you're, you, and it's just like, I, I, God is near. God is here. And you, you can remember praying your guts out. Again, you, you hadn't read the first book about prayer. You hadn't hardly read the Bible, but you knew that you were alive and that he was there and that he was listening. And I'll tell you what, if you're here and you're a new believer, see me after the service, I want you praying for me. New believers, you guys, pray, you, new believer, pray, answer. I mean, it's just like God will go, well, what do you want? What do you need? Ding, ding, <laughs> ding, ding. You know, it's just like, so after the service, if you're a new believer, come find me. I'm going to give you my list. <laughs> so what's the result of that? Well, listen, saints and sons, when we spend time with him who is excellent, What's going to happen to us? Right? So spiritually, we're told that the, guy, the king looks on and goes, I've got I to gotta, I gotta establish the realm. I've got to make sure that everything's in order. I've got, my, I've got 120. I've got three over those. But there's an excellent spirit in him. I might put everything under him. All of it. So the practice of prayer perfects us. Again, I'm just looking exclusively at the passage our spirits, and then our character. We're told Daniel also um, uh, uh, of him, really, that God sent his angel to rescue Daniel because he was blameless before him and, and men. He says, you know, King, I haven't done anything before, wrong before you either. And, and, and we're Calvary Chapel guys, and we have a saying that I don't know that ultimately originated with us, but we often say it, and I think we say it all together right. Let, listen, this book will keep you from sin, but sin will keep you from this book. And how also true is it of our prayers? It seems again from this one passage that Daniel's pattern before God in prayer, the practice of his prayer so consistently kept him right as far as his character was concerned with God and others. The practice of prayer perfects us, our spirits, our character, and finally our faith. I like that Daniel said that God's angel rescued him because. There were two becauses. There in the, in, in the passage, because I was found innocent before him and because he believed in his God. And again, we know scripture is very plain. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's a simple, undeniable biblical fact. But listen, is it also not true that our faith grows when our prayers are answered? Doesn't your faith grow when you speak to the invisible God and the things that you and you alone between the two of you discussed actually comes to pass? Does your faith not grow? Think with me about the first church, you know, those earliest disciples, God's apostles, the 12. They walked with him and they talked with him along life's narrow way, as the old hymn says. But then he was gone. What do you do now? He said to them in the upper room discourse, and in that day you'll ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask, the Father in my name he will give you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Listen to this. Ask, you will receive, that your joy may be full. Gentlemen, when we pray and our prayers are answers, does not our faith grow? Okay, if that's true, then if we pray often and we're answered often, how much more will our faith grow too? So Daniel's prayers, I would say, you know, perfected him and his faith grew. By the way, I, I think it's interesting, back in chapter 2, and maybe just even somebody needs to hear this, but in Daniel chapter 2, 
Daniel with his boys, they prayed for something that had never happened at it had never happened in the history of the world. And that was not only that God would actually reveal the interpretation of the dream, but remember Nebuchadnezzar, he played that game, that sort of sick game. He came to his wise men and said, unless you can tell me the dream and its interpretation, I'm going to slay all you. What does Daniel do? Oh, Lord, nobody ever done that before. I mean, you know, dreams ain't no problem for you. I mean, interpretation of dreams, I got a gift for that. Knowing the dream that the man won't tell anybody, that's a whole other scenario. What does Daniel show? Because I got the dream. I'm, I got the dream and I got the interpretation. I don't know. Is there something? Is there something that you're facing right now? Is there some situation that you go, there is, it, 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 I, it is so utterly hopeless. Could you be facing something? Could you need something right now? You go, I don't know that anyone's ever prayed that prayer before. Don't be afraid to do it. Anything impossible with God? No. Never happened before. Daniel's practice of prayer perfected him, his spirit, his character, his faith. Then, number two, the practice of prayer positions us. Now, I love this, and I think this is going to make a difference to every one of us in the room where men, listen, seems to me, based upon this chapter, as long as Daniel went low before the God of heaven, God exalted him, positioned him higher and higher before men on earth. It's interesting that we learn Daniel went low in prayer and often, and it was often that God exalted Daniel on the earth. Listen, Daniel was both frequently low before God in prayer and frequently exalted before men on earth. And again, there's not really much more to say to a group of men because the fact is every single one of us wants to succeed in life, right? Every one of us wants to succeed. We want to go as high as God wants us to go, and you should. Here's the key. The practice of prayer perfects us, positions us, and finally, number three, the practice of prayer protects us from the fall. The practice of prayer protects us from the fall. Real quick, how does an 80-year-old man survive a 20-foot fall into a pit, let alone the lions? He prayed. Men who've fallen, and we all know them, are men who failed in prayer. Men who've fallen, and we all know them, are men who failed in prayer, period. Daniel prayed often. He practiced praying. His prayers perfected him. His prayers positioned him. The lower he went, the higher God took him. It's a little bit like Jesus, right? And his prayers protected him from the fall. Now listen. If all this is true, like if, if, if what we've just seen here is true, like if I've got, if I've got my sights set on this in an appropriate way, like if, if this is the kind of stuff that happens when a man prays, okay, what happens when he doesn't? What happens when we don't? And gentlemen, right now, in this moment in history, and in every single one of our lives, now is the time to double down and commit for the first time, listen, or recommit to develop a life of prayer. Amen?